Okay, welcome back, guys, to Sabado Sessions podcast. Uh, we're your hosts, and today we have none other than Canada's pride, Bryce Krawcheck. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> how you been, sir? How was training? How was life? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Training is training is a lot of rebuilding right now. I'm working through some injuries that I've been dealing with for a while uh, that started to really impact my performance more than I wanted them to. So I'm taking the necessary steps back to get healthy so that I can uh, perform better. But okay. other than that, I mean, when training is less, that leaves a little bit more time and energy for life. So I'm enjoying more work and more play and some other stuff that isn't lifting right now a little bit. So it's good. What what is the what is the play and entail entail? <laughs> uh, mostly mostly video games. Spending extra time with uh, with my wife and with my buddies. Um, yeah, that kind of stuff. I know, I know I know it's I know it's non powerlifting related, but what what game are you banging out right now? Uh, I'm playing a little bit of Street Fighter Five and a little bit of Overwatch Two. At the oh moment. wow! Yeah. yeah. So you're not just a button masher; you're actually like about this, this combo <laughs> life. <laughs> maybe maybe still a bit of a button masher okay 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 yeah but yeah no like, okay go go back to lifting um you know what i'm just gonna say it, say it now we well, i i know I, I remember this but we actually had the honor and privilege to meet you uh in calgary worlds 20, uh, 2018 2018 yeah, yeah and i did on. i did take a picture with you and the other bryce okay uh, yeah, yeah. The, the do you little... still do you do you still have the picture in your bedroom mate my bedroom. Oh no, 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 no. Oh, no. Okay. It's not. It's not. It's not. No, my missus would not have that. But um, no, I, I still have it. My favorites. Like I remember you saying, like, yeah, let's do a price sandwich. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I'm the filling boy. <laughs> oh man. Okay. But no, that was that was so good, man. Because um, again, like, so like back to lifting. I've been a fan of you, of you, uh, yeah, of you for like a good while before I actually, we actually headed up to Calgary. And man, when I saw you lifting, like I was, I was just, I don't, I don't know. Just, was, say, I, just say you, see it's blushing already, bro. Yeah, okay. bro, I, bro I'm not, yeah, I was fangirling like crazy. Oh, all I can say, bro, is literally, I did not get a rest on that flight back home. Literally, all <laughs> No, for back, real. Man. I met Bryce Lewis. I met Bryce um, Cross Call. That's it. I'm done. Literally, nice. like my dream day. I was like, yeah, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I almost forgot what I was there for. <laughs> but... <laughs> he, he was there to support me, but you, you even forget I existed. Yeah, <laughs> I, had, I had to. And do you, and you know what it was? I was like, oh, I was actually talking to Juris. I was like, yo, do you reckon it'll be all right with me? Like, asking them for a picture. And uh, I, I remember some dude in the crowd. Um, he was like, oh, do you want a picture with Bryce? I was like, yeah, yeah, but I don't know. He, he looks like he's with his missus. I don't want to disturb him. I was like, no, no, I reckon he's good with it. And then I, I, he pushed me to ask. And, I, and then, yeah, so, yeah, hi, hi, history yes. done there, boy. <laughs> anyway, I've got a question on that meet, Bryce. In terms yeah. of, like, um, I mean, coming to Calgary in 2018, mm -hmm the battle people were waiting and the people were anticipating was the 105, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the powerlifting world, everyone that loved powerlifting that day stopped doing what they were doing because the 105 were on the platform. So my question leading to that is, because of that success that you guys brought on the platform that day, has it had any impact in Canada in terms of powerlifting? Hmm. You know, I'm honestly not sure. I'm not sure if I've talked to many people who have had you know that event as their first exposure to powerlifting um it was definitely really cool to be able to have so many friends and family and acquaintances and like you know even kind of loose connections in the fitness industry that i had not seen for years come out to watch because it was in calgary so it was awesome to see how many people were packed in there i don't know if that had like a lasting impact on things um but it certainly was you know, a really great moment for the Calgary scene and the Calgary strength community. I remember um, the gym that we were training out of at the time, the strength edge, you know, people came through there every day for a week and a half to come check the place out, to come and train. And at the time I was doing a lot more in-person stuff. So I was always around and got to meet all these people from all over the world. Uh, and it was, it was a really, really awesome 
experience from from my perspective mm-hmm. um but yeah i'm not sure if i could speak to whether or not it was like you know uh had a big impact on the on the grander scale of things bro we we visited the gym we visited the, the strength edge and i yeah. loved it man i was yeah, like spot, this man. like Obviously, I've only ever seen it through the videos that you post, like on YouTube and Instagram and everything else. And it was everything I expected and more. Like I was doing I was doing shit in there that I don't usually do, but I thought, fuck it, while I'm here, let's <laughs> let's have it out anyway. I was like trying to have fun with the chains and everything else, like I don't yeah. usually do. But yeah, no, um, like like just like from what Jurin just said there on the impact it had on the community, there was something about 2018 that I don't know if you noticed. It was the changeover where, um, like, just for example, with the 83s, you know, John Hack was like, all right, cool, IPF, I'm out. But then, mm-hmm. I, I don't know I don't know if you remember, but he actually made his way to Worlds 2018 to watch the Battle of the 83s. And, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew that. Yeah, and I, I don't know if he drove up or something like that. I don't know. Um, I can't, I can't remember, remember the details, but... That was definitely something like not just in not just in your weight class, but every other weight class. It was like a big turn of it was like it was like the pre, you know, France force sort of uh the you know, the coming of whatever. It was it was just that year. I thought it was, it was like this is this is leading to something special. Mm-hmm. Like so that's that's why I saw and then obviously when there was the battle of the one oh fives that you did, and I was up on the the um what's it called that balcony area bit i don't know if you remember yeah. the the setup but yeah. man I, I was screaming my head off i was like oh my god hook grip hero because <laughs> like man like i'm pretty sure you were the from what I, I think anyway the person that advocated um hook grip one well one of the b- biggest advocates of hook grip into powerlifting because i mean everyone was pulling mixed grip i was pulling mixed grip and issues were arising and then that's when i stumbled onto your video i was like yo he's making a lot of sense here like you know the imbalances and everything else hmm. so when when you put that i was like yo let me try this shit and it fucking hurt like hell <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah it kind of always on, sucks that's for sure on that note um, uh, 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 bryce what what did push you into that hook group mechanism because it's not something that anyone will stumble on because it hurts so what made you like do you know what I'm going to try this shit. Let's see if it sticks. So I think it was the first, hmm, would have been the first like three or four times I tried to pull 365 or 800 in, in competition. And I kept missing it at the same spot. And I kept kind of getting hung up and opening my hand on my quads. And that little bit of windmill was enough for it to like push my hand down into my thigh. And I would just open my hand up every time. And I think I, it was, yeah, I think three or four times in competition, I had attempted that weight and not quite gotten it. Uh, so I decided to switch to hook grip basically for that so that I wasn't opening my hand up on my thigh. And when I did, uh, it just, that allowed me to push my, uh, my deadlifts a lot further, obviously. So yeah, it just seemed to make sense. You know, I tried it and it worked and it went from there. And you, and you, and you've been doing it since basically, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So sick. Man. So pretty much like you can call yourself as, um, uh, well, um, Mike T of hook grip in powerlifting, isn't it? <laughs> because... I don't know about that. I think there's probably been a lot of people using hook grip over the years, but maybe I was part of a, at the, a few at the people top around level, that time. You know, at the top level, to... like you were the big advocate that we all follow. You know what I mean? Some of us literally like just to follow the trend. Um, leading to that, my question is like, yeah, we spoke about your deadlift. Yes, of course. Mm-hmm. For people that don't know, Bryce has got the biggest deadlift in IPF, right? In terms of like, uh, yeah, no, I know uh, Ray has pulled what three, what no one has ever pulled 400, is it? In RPF, yeah. no one, yeah, Christoph pulled 420 in RPF, yeah, at the world games in Poland. Oh, yeah, that was equipped. Isn't it? I'm talking about row, so no one has pulled yeah. um, that much that 400 row yet, isn't it? Uh, I believe Jesus Olivares has. Maybe not at an international, but he's pulled 400 in competition oh, yeah. in an IPF affiliate. Uh, and I think there's been a couple other ones now that have been yeah. in and around that like 385, 395 mark. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I'd have to look it up. But 
Yeah, but the, but the body weight, you're kind of leading, kind of leading the pack there when it comes to body weight, isn't it? In terms of like Perhaps, who's yeah. lighter and all that. Anyway, um, my question leading to that is because you have this massive deadlift, right? Every time Bryce, you, you're on the platform, whether it's equipped, whether it's 120, whether it's 105, people just anticipating that big number. So where mm-hmm. that big number started, where, where was your base? Did you just jump into the gym and start putting 300 kilos or you started somewhere like some of us? Uh, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't that far off. I often recount the story of the first time I like ever, ever deadlifted anything. Uh, and I think it was up around 150 or 160 kilos for like a set of eight stiff legged. Um, I, I just, my, I, I went in, my buddy was like, this is how you do a deadlift. And I was like, okay, cool. And then he put more plates on and more plates on and more plates on. And he's like, kind of looking at me like, what? Okay. You're still <laughs> keeping up. Hey. He's like, well, it, it'll make it harder if you put your hips like way up behind you like this. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll do that. And then I don't think, I think it was probably four months or so from that deadlift to the next time I deadlifted. Cause my, like I was in so much pain, my, my back and my legs were so sore and so wrecked for so long that I didn't deadlift again for quite some time. Damn. How, how but, heavy were you at that time? Oh, um, when I started lifting maybe like 160 pounds. What's that in kilos? That's, uh, 70 just, something kilos. Isn't it? Yeah. 70 something kilos. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere around Fuck. there. And that's, right that's... off the bat, it's like 150 stiff leg. <laughs> <laughs> Cause Cause I, reps. Remember, <laughs> I remember finding an old training log of mine and I was like celebrating the fact that I had gained weight and was now 170 pounds. So, uh, yeah, it definitely started as a, as a much smaller person than I am now. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, I mean, did you, did you had a sports background or you just powerlifting? It was the only thing for you. Yeah, I definitely played a lot of different sports growing up. I played baseball. I played soccer, like uh, football, what are you going to call it? Uh, European style football, football, by the way. No, yeah. no, that's the real football there. Yeah. Uh, I played a lot of that. Um, I did like some martial arts for a minute when I was really young. Um, yeah, I I was just kind of always involved in active stuff. So I had a pretty good sense of how to move and I never really stood out. I don't think as an athlete, uh, I pushed soccer, probably the football, probably the hardest, uh, as a competitive thing, but I think still was probably like, I don't know, you know, local level B tier kind of traveling team. So it was a little bit more competitive than, uh, you know, the, the basic league, but it still wasn't anything even close to you know even canadian level national big time or anything what, what, what positions so, did you play um i kind of bounced around a lot i played a lot of of, uh, of defense so center back i reckon yeah. you i reckon you had the height and like the build yeah, for it somewhere around there yeah yeah we, yeah we used to just call them like defense forward and and then the mids yeah yeah, and yeah. we didn't get too too in depth on all the strategy because that's still pretty <laughs> young, but, uh, yeah <laughs> Yeah, I was yeah. a defender. I'd steal the ball and kick it really hard up the field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with with your size and strength, I can't imagine that you being that. Because I play football football myself, but I was more in the middle. Me, just like, yes, I had the strength, but I was a very small guy, so I couldn't do much. To be fair, yeah. <laughs> you know what, Bryce? Um, is there if it's right with you? Let's talk about something much much more current. Uh, okay. lo- last uh, comp you did was South Africa Worlds. Mm-hmm. I believe, yeah. Uh, before you know, just before we get onto how you th- you think it all went down for yourself, was there anything uh, like from the other weight classes that you were like, "Whoa, like what the f?" Like, is there anything uh, that impressed you? Probably one of the biggest ones was uh, the battle between uh, Jess Pitner and Agatha. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That to me was one of the like, I don't know. I, I don't know if I've seen somebody challenge Jess as much before, uh, especially not in person. Uh, so that was really cool. And then to see Agatha come around between deadlift attempts to get into the audience to watch Jessica's deadlift attempt to potentially beat her yeah. and cheer her on the whole time. I was just like that to me, that's like, that's the kind of attitude and the kind of perspective that got me into the sport. Cause it was people competing against me, cheering for me and me coming off and being like, why are you cheering for me? Like, if I, if I get that, you lose. 
but it yeah. doesn't matter. Like people are still, you know, going Whoop. in for you and cheering and clapping and yelling and stuff. And that, that was part of what kind of opened the floodgates of me becoming uh, fully obsessed with powerlifting. Is, so is that, see that was cool. So, so that's something that happened to you. What your very first comp? Yeah. Yeah. I just like, I didn't know anybody. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily that it was my competitors, but it was, you know, people who for like, as far as I could tell, like, I don't know why any of these people would care whether I was successful mm. or not, but it was all the people who were also there competing. So, you know, other competitors that were cheering me on and, you know, giving me props when I came back off the, off the platform and being like, Oh, put some weight on the bar, man. That looked too easy. And like, yeah, yeah, you know, just like an eruption of applause for doing a lift. I was like, Oh, this is amazing. This feels so good, you know? Yeah. And that was kind of what, what got me into it all. But I mean, it's definitely a huge contrast, you know, from like the other sports that you did where perhaps the competitors that you're going up against aren't so, you know, like, Hey, go you like yeah. sort of, uh, and then yeah. coming, coming to something like this and it's like, whoa this i feel as though it's something very different very different yeah. uh yeah, i'm pretty sure good. each and every one of us in this like podcast now has experienced something pretty much similar but yeah no um <laughs> back to uh the south africa worlds i know you mentioned the 76s and there was a battle there are mm -hmm. you uh, like i know like you have a lot of time sort of like that's mostly busy and now you're saying now you have a bit more time to do game and everything else but um do you also like look out for other lifters like globally like say you just mentioned the 76s like are you looking out over 76s because there's the girl that's also in 76 from new zealand mm -hmm. uh carlina tongo t mm -hmm. and she's looking to grab a bit of what's what's you know hers to claim Absolutely. against yeah. against just bitner and mm -hmm. uh agatha so, uh, have you uh, sort of thought, oh, that's going to be a, a very good battle again come Malta 2023? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, so I don't follow as closely as I used to with a lot of the other weight classes and stuff. Um, you know, I kind of go through phases where I pay more and less attention even to my own weight class. Mm. Uh, and usually like getting closer to competition is when I'll go through and look at the roster that I'm competing against and look everybody up and look at their numbers and find them on Instagram and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but a lot of the times I find for me, that stuff to be a little, a little distracting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard for me to like remove all of the other awesome stuff that everybody's doing from my head when I need to train. And I feel, you know, beyond compelled to be like, Holy shit, I got to try to keep up. Like I got to push harder. I got to do more. I got to load more weight. And I think sometimes that leads to me not making great decisions. So for me, sometimes paying a little bit less attention to powerlifting as a whole allows me to be a better trainee and a better athlete. Um, so yeah, I'm probably not the, uh, you know, the guy who's up to date on every up and coming lifter in all the categories. And it's also something that changes so often, you know, there's so many incredible talented lifters coming up from juniors and that still are juniors and yeah it's just wild would you uh, just a following question on that but would you even though you don't follow it as as much as you said like you don't sometimes you lose track we all do literally because mm. <clears throat> some of us have got different lives as well so sometimes it's just that i'm too preoccupied with some certain stuff i don't do it but would you say powerlifting has come a long way where from where you started or from where you start watching people lifting to where we are today yeah yeah absolutely um the first meet i went to uh or sorry the second meet second meet i ever competed in was was westerns uh and it was anybody could compete you didn't need any kind of qualifying total uh i think there were probably i don't know maybe 20 competitors uh it was it was just like a, a local meet basically it, yeah. was, it was no different from the meet i did before it which was very much just a local meet um so to go from that to two weekends ago i think now um we hosted westerns here in calgary and it was hundreds of lifters it was three days long uh it was packed flights packed sessions lifters from you know uh, i think the first way in was 6 a.m 
So lifter starting at 8 a.m. The last flight of the day started at 4 p.m. So it was, you know, 12 hours of lifting in a lot of cases or 14 hours of lifting. And yeah, so I mean, that honestly is kind of serendipitous that that just happened, but that creates a pretty interesting and, and really sort of good illustration of just how much the community's grown and how much more interest there is in it. Mm-hmm. And certainly along with that comes obviously the, the increase in the talent and mm. the increase in the ability and capability of, of lifters today, you know, uh, for, for my own part, I was like, I was part of that kind of a wave of lifter who was coming through and like, you know, breaking records and, you know, doing stuff that people didn't think was possible. And now there's just more people doing that again to my generation. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Coming yeah. through and, and the 23 year old guys smashing 400 plus kilo squats and, you know, crazy, crazy stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I've seen it, seen it grow an incredible amount. I did my first competition, um, 10 years ago now. Right. So I start, com- I've been, I've been competing in powerlifting for a decade and training for powerlifting for, you know, probably 11 or 12 years now, but, uh, yeah, definitely seen a lot of change, a lot of change. Yeah. The, um, obviously you've had a lot of experience in the decade or so of powerlifting and you've dabbled, I mean, you've competed in a high level in both raw and equipped. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously you coach a good amount of people too. What, like just off the top of your head, do you not, are there any that are actually interested still in equipped? Do I have any interest in equipped? No, no, as in like the people you coach or like the people around you. Yeah, yeah, I coach a good number of equipped lifters, actually. Um, yeah. I have one lifter going to Open Worlds from Iceland who just mm-hmm. competed in uh, the Western Europeans. Um, I have a lifter going to Masters Worlds here uh, next week, actually, uh, to compete equipped. And I have a number of other lifters, even at the local level, who have like messed around with equipment before and are hoping to do, you know, maybe a bench only meet and just mm. play around with the bench shirt. Or, you know, I think there's a, a good number of people who, who find that interesting enough. It's just whether or not they are in a position where they can go in and maybe have somebody wrap their knees for the first time or have somebody hand off and understand what somebody being in a bench shirt is going to look like, mm-hmm. um, that kind of stuff. So it, there, there's a bit of a barrier to entry, but I certainly don't think that, uh, you know, it, it's not, it's not dead. I don't think at all. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm happy you said barriers to entry because, um, before worlds, uh, in South Africa this year, and actually even before junior worlds, uh, there was a, a lot, a bit of a talk, not so great, but there was a bit of talk about uh, the ratio of how many uh, classic lifters there are in comparison to equipped lifters. I mean, like mm-hmm. you said, you know, it's not dead, but would you say it's uh, not as popular, I would say, um, in comparison to when you first started, you know, a decade ago, or is it just because there's so mu- much more, uh, you know, classic, classic raw lifters and the barrier to entry to it is, you know, not as steep. Uh, that makes the ratio between equipped and raw so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, the, one of the biggest things is obviously that barrier to entry. Like, not everybody can get a hold of a piece of equipment. And if they can, you know, who's to say whether it fits or fits mm-hmm. really poorly and feels like shit and they never want to do it again because you know they stuff themselves into this insanely tight comp fit squad suit for their first time yeah. under the bar in a suit and they're like well never doing that again that felt terrible <laughs> um you know those kinds of experiences do happen for sure um i think there's also you know if, you, if you're not fortunate enough to live where there's a pocket of equipped lifting that exists it's really hard to do on your own you know without some kind of guidance without you know, hands to help pull your sleeves up and the bench shirt. And yeah, like I said, hand off and, and do that kind of stuff. So I think it's, it's a lot easier for somebody to just pick up classic lifting and to mm-hmm. just do it. You don't really need anything, you know, you just need a bar and a, a place to squat or whatever. So there's definitely a difference in how easy it is to get started. And I think that accounts for a lot of why you see such an explosion in popularity in, in classic lifting. Um, but I also think that 
the more classic lifting grows, the more people are going to become really, really interested in powerlifting as a whole and see equip lifting and feel drawn to equip lifting and then try it out uh, and potentially, you know, not go back or potentially do both uh, for a period of time. So I think as classic grows, that is kind of what feeds equip lifting mm -hmm. um, in, in a lot of ways. So uh, yeah. I think that it, you'll continue to see them both kind of grow, but classic lifting will obviously grow faster because it's so, so much easier to do. Yeah. And so you, what's, you, yeah, go on, um, Jay. What's, what's your preference between the two? Because I know mm. this is a hard question, mm -hmm. but which one do you prefer more? I don't know if I, I don't know if I have one that I, I prefer more outright. I think classic fits my life really well now because I'm fairly busy with a lot of different things. And one of the big things with equip lifting is that it is a huge time commitment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd go in and, and do, you know, my day might be, let's say two squat singles and a couple triples and then two or three bench singles and, you know, two or three triples. And that day would take me four to four and a half hours. By the time you're loading the weight, warming up raw, loading a bunch more plates, getting into your equipment, yeah. you know, wrapping and unwrapping your knees, straps up, straps down, and then the same whole thing, you know, over in the bench shirt. So the time commitment for me was one of the things that keeps me from equipped lifting currently. Um, but it certainly is very, very exhilarating. Um, yeah. you know, it, it feels awesome to, you know, squat weights that are way beyond what you've ever touched raw and to, to lift weights that are way beyond, um, you know, the, there's an extra level of exhilaration and stimulation and excitement. And, uh, it's just, it's, yeah, it's, it's wild, but like I, I know this this I might be wrong here, but is does that exhilaration come from like man, this weight is so stupidly heavy. I might actually die from this. Uh maybe subconsciously. I try not to think about dying <laughs> no, under the bar the, while I'm doing it. But... The, the only reason I'm asked because I myself have dabbled in um uh equipped bench. Mm -hmm. And shit, I'm not gonna lie to you, when things go wrong, like way wrong. And obviously I get saved because obviously I'm still here. Like I just, I can't help but laugh loud from like that exhilaration from, oh shit, I just, just cheated death really. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, I definitely um, at one point was trying to play around with how, how quick I was descending in the squat. Um, I had 350 or 355, three, somewhere between 345 and 355 on the bar. And I went down real fast to try to catch a bit more bounce because there's a you know sort of common um, concept or idea that in equipment you want to descend as fast as you can while in control. Hopefully you get a little bit more stretch reflex. You know I've heard a lot of same arguments for raw lifting in a lot of cases, but mm -hmm. I was like, okay, you know I want to I want to try this out. I'm gonna try this out on this rep. I hit the bottom and I popped forward a little bit too much, and on my way back up I took a step, and I ended up you know, crumpling and the bar like flew over my head oh, and my shit. ankle bent at like the weirdest angle you'll ever see. Uh, and then walk, like just got up and was like, Oh shit. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, I, I think what we did was that happened with like 350, and I was like, okay, well, I guess going down fast doesn't work. So, mm -hmm. you know, we popped it back up on the squat rack and we went up five kilos and I squatted five kilos more like immediately afterwards uh and it went fine it went great just like it should yeah, but yeah. uh yeah i don't know there's definitely a pretty funny video uh of me doing what i called my uh my pr equipped lunge <laughs> with, i mean if you ever with, find out adequate spotters i think i just had dylan behind me so that was oh, very no. wise of me, but if you do find it though, can you please send it to Jurens? So uh I don't know, maybe oh, use yeah. it for like a little preview yeah, of this sure uh, YouTube. Okay, cool. Um Thanks. no, I, I was also gonna say, you know, you're one of the rare few, I would believe, that does both raw and equipped. You know, there's only a handful that I can think of, you know, there's yourself, there's Agatha, and then our very own over here, Tony Cliff. I was just gonna say you can't forget. Yeah, Tony yeah. Clive. Tony <laughs> Clive, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, of course, you know, you, I think you two have gone head to head a few times, right? 
Uh, yeah, we competed together in 2019. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, 2019 was the equipped one, isn't it? The yeah. one in uh, uh, where was it? Saudi Arabia. Uh, in Dubai. Yeah. In Dubai. Uh, so it was Dubai. Yeah. 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 2019, you competed together, uh, but you didn't do classic in 2019, did you? No, I didn't. No. In Sweden. No. Okay. And then 2021, we competed together classic. Yeah. And in 2022, yeah. he was prepping for World Games. Mm-hmm. So we didn't yeah. compete together uh, in South Africa. Yo, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, Agatha but in a bit, but I just want to talk a little bit more about Tony Clive uh, just because, just because, just because. Like, do you, do you not find it insane that he trains by himself, both equipped and raw? Oh, for sure. Like, I don't see you doing, I'm not saying, you know, you're not as good as him or anything like that, but yo, he I does mean, it in his shed by himself, wrapping up those, like, wrapping up those mm-hmm. knee wraps by himself, getting those suits by himself. And, and the, the craziest thing, and, and Mike T did this too, but doing equipped bench with no handoff breaks my brain. I don't understand how you do it or how somebody could like have any semblance of position mm. or tightness while trying to unrack the weights that you use in a bench shirt. That's the thing that for me, like I can, you know, uh, squatting, deadlifting equipped alone, as long as you have good safeties, like sure, not that crazy to me, but unracking your own bench presses in a bench shirt, especially when you're a bencher like Tony, who's a very good bencher mm. uh, and Mike, who also, you know, benched a lot equipped. It just, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't get it. And it feels terrible when I try to do it. So I, I don't do it. I don't bench equipped without a handoff. I can't. Is that, is you know, that, a- I, I said this to a lot of people I said, the only person that will understand and probably think how mad and crazy this is, is someone that's done this equipped before. Cause someone like me, right? Cause I train alone as well, but I do roll. I do, a, I train alone mm-hmm. as well. But when Tony does that, and when some, someone goes, oh, yeah, but Tony t- trained alone in his gym, I was like, yeah, I train alone too. So mm-hmm. to me, it doesn't really matter, isn't it? You have to train alone. That's why I always tell Joey, if you can't lift the weight on the bar, don't rely on the spotters. Just don't lift it. Don't load the bar. Simple as that. So, again, with the Tony situation, again, as I said, because you've done equipped, Joey has done equipped himself. That's what both of you are sitting here thinking, this is madness how Tony does it. So mm-hmm. use people like you that have to tell people like me how hard it is. Because me, I look at it, I'm thinking, it's just lifting, man. Just put a shirt on and go and unwrap the bar. So nah. it's just wait. <laughs> yeah. It's a different beast entirely. But no, like, um, I was going to ask as well, because obviously, you, if you, like you said, it, it frazzles, um, I forgot the word you used, but it frazzles your brain a little bit how Tony does it uh, mm-hmm. with no handoffs. Is that the type of shit that you had mentioned earlier, like, you know, like if you go on an Instagram and it's like, oh man, he's doing this by himself. I gotta do better. I gotta do better. Is that <laughs> is that is that what enters your head as well? No, um, it's it's more just the the ability of a lot of people to train with really heavy weights, seemingly all of the time. Uh, and Tony's actually a good example of that. You know, mm. like I, I see the training that he puts up, and it looks like he just goes hard as hell all the time. And, you know, he's like, oh, got to do eights today. I guess I'll do, I don't know, 300. And you're just like, man, come <laughs> on. It's like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. But, uh, so would you more, go more back to yourself? Kind of use. Would, would we see you in the quips again? Or is this something? Potentially. We would... I definitely wouldn't rule it out. Yeah. I have no, no concrete plans, but I got a couple of things rattling around in my brain. We'll see how it all pans out over the next, uh, next little while. Not right not turning a cliff, years. I hope. Hmm? Not turning a cliff right now, right in around in your brain, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> You're just uh, not, no. Tony's a good guy. Man. I really this? like Tony. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I I said earlier I was gonna talk about Agatha because uh, you know, she's one of the few that do both as well. Mm-hmm. Uh I, you know, we've had her on this uh, podcast as well. Um oh, really? I don't I don't know if you've ever heard any rumors, but we def she definitely confirmed it here that she trains SBD six days a week six days a week bro and well first off what, what's your order did, did, no, did bryce heard you heard properly that you said she trained spd bryce 
six days a week. Yeah, yeah I, 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 heard I, that. I just want to know what his thoughts are on it because, uh, you know, we've had Pan on as well. He does uh, three SPD days a week. So mm-hmm. it's just six. Uh, I just want to know, I know. I want to hear it from what you think of it. Well, uh, I think that when you're uh, young and you can recover and adapt from all that, like, I don't know, it's clearly working for, her, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, <laughs> um i i don't think there's anything wrong with that i think that uh it may not work for her forever but who knows and uh like who cares really uh she's getting insane results doing it and uh yeah is able to seemingly clearly recover and perform that way i know um when i was prepping for 2016 worlds uh i was doing spd four days a week so I would have my comp squat bench and deadlift. I would have an exposure of every single session, at least baseline volume. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then on top of that, I would have one heavy session of each comp lift per week. And on top of that, I would also have multiple bench variations throughout the week. And, uh, you know, I'd have my, my, my third day of the week would be pause squat and then comp squat or comp squat and then pause squat. And then my fourth day of the week would be deadlifts and then pause deadlifts. So I'd have multiple variations on top of doing comp deadlift four days a week. And I would break my sessions up into two days and, you know, essentially have eight training sessions throughout the week. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know, like, I, and I'm not, I'm not trying to like be like, Oh yeah, well back in my day, I didn't know. I just think <laughs> that like, yeah. I mean, I think that when you're that adaptable, you take advantage of it yeah and it's tough to find a balance of what you can handle and what you can't and and try to ride that line so basically i would just kind of tip my hat and say like shit yeah keep going as long as you can and you know hopefully you can like ride that wave for a good long time and then figure out how that changes over time if it does fuck i just want to go back to what you said there like eight sessions a week yeah, like if you look back at Mike's old Project Momentum stuff, uh-huh. uh, he called it way back when, uh, you'll see some examples of the kind of programming that, uh, that I was doing to prep for that. Now, it wasn't necessary uh, to break them up into two days, but for me, it was probably like, you know, my shorter sessions would be like three and a half hours, and my longer sessions would be, I don't know, four, four and a half, if I did it all in one. So because I was essentially living at the gym anyways, training a lot of people in person, doing a lot of coaching, uh, it made more sense for me to, you know, go in, uh, hit the first part of my day, take a nap, eat some food, get up, train some clients, eat some more food, do my second part of the day, train some more people, eat some food, go home, go to sleep. Like that was just life, you know? Bro, holy Uh, shit. That's like a full fledged athlete life almost. Yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much what it was. And I imagine that's probably something like what Agatha is doing. So right. would, that, would, would, would you say, Bryce, if, let's say, young newcomers coming to our sports, right? And every yeah. time when people watch people like yourself, I mean, people like yourself, they watch Jess, Agatha, and all of that, anyone want to mm-hmm. get to the top, right? Would you say that is an approach, a young lifter or a newcomer to the game, should adopt i wouldn't say should but i would not i would also just not leave it off the table um and i I probably wouldn't limit it to younger lifters either i think there's probably like masters lifters who can handle that level of volume i I don't know that age is like the it might be a pretty good predictor but uh also i think training age is maybe Mm -hmm. more important than like biological age when we're talking about this Mm stuff Mm um so yeah i mean I also wouldn't say that like if you've been lifting weights for two years and you want to get into powerlifting, try this. You know what I mean? That was that was still, you know, like four years into me competing in powerlifting. So probably about six years of me lifting uh before have, I started have, training have, like that. Have you given that some that sort of approach to someone? Like have you sort of gone? I've used not... similar things with lifters. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I haven't found anybody that 
you know, uh, is able to really push that. You mean with not, any you haven't found anyone that did as well as success, you. but I've definitely used some strategies similar to that, maybe for uh, a shortened block. If we're, you know, two blocks out from competition, we only have time for a two week block here because we need four or five heading to the meet. Maybe those two weeks look something like that. But is it be, just because is we it, have a limited amount of time but because when you, what you said there earlier is like when you were having your eight sessions a week is we're pretty much living in the gym so i mean fitness was part of your life right? it was my life i mean was it. so fitness was your life so to me like would you say that can only work with someone that has time you know someone like has got like a second job or a family or other responsibility in the other way so would you say that? Probably. I mean, that's, that's probably a safe bet to assume that unless you can, you know, commit all of your extra time to mostly things that will contribute to recovery and that, you know, it's, it's going to be a delicate balancing act of stress and recovery. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that'd be probably not too far off, but who knows, man, I, I I'd never, never like to speak in absolutes because there's going to be somebody out there who works a friggin' manual labor job and is on their feet, like shoveling stuff for seven hours a day that could thrive on that kind of program. Yeah. And yeah. I haven't met that person, but I also wouldn't say that they don't exist. Yeah. I would say oh, that those okay. people are probably, you know, few and far between, but it could, it could be. Do you know? Do you know who I, who I thought of immediately when you said manual labor and then still manages to train? Maybe not mm -hmm. as uh, many as uh, eight sessions, but I know six days a week training is Dylan Nelson, uh, in Team GB. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. He he does like a super like arduous manual labor job, and still manages to train six days a week. I find that mad. But yeah, uh, the, kid, I, the kid is mad. <laughs> So yeah, he, Dylan is not a good example to give here because anyone that watched Dylan's training is just it's madness. I don't know how he does that. After 12 hours, 13 hours shift, and then you go and do what he does, just yeah, just madness. Yeah. Uh, you know what? He actually has a um a keenness to do equip lifting as well. So I don't know if you ever have spoken to him before. I reckon <laughs> you two might have a lot to talk about. He is he is quite on the wild side, especially after a few drinks. I think that's leave, a, that, that's leave, an under, that's an understatement, but like yeah, um, <laughs> leave Dylan out of it. Uh, Bryce, my question to what we just said there, but in terms of like the method of programming and how it works on yourself and how you um, try and then use it for some of your athletes. So, what would you um, what I mean, just in general, right? What I'd, as a coach, not as a lifter, but we'll we'll get to that as a lifter like, um, later on. As a coach. What advice would you give to young lifters that are coming to our sports? Because every young lifter nowadays, when they come in, right, the first point is they look at the top lifter in the country. The next thing they go like, ah, oh, in seven months' time, I should be able to deadlift as much as that or squat more than him. So what advice would you give to these people? Hmm. So probably one piece of advice and one analogy that I, I need to figure out where I got this from, but, uh, the, the piece of advice would just be to try not to get, uh, overwhelmed, try not to get overwhelmed with the amount of information, the amount of, uh, you know, conflicting takes on whether a thing is good or bad or optimal or not, or you should be doing more volume or less volume or more frequency or less frequency or, you know, all comp lifts or no comp lifts or whatever try not to get overwhelmed with that and just find a program or a thing that looks like it might work and give it a shot and go from there. Like just, just take the first step. And I promise like, you'll get there, you'll figure it out. Just put the time into it, do the reps and you'll start to notice what works and what doesn't. The other, the, the analogy that I like to give, and I, I think, I think I got this from Isabella von Weissenberg. At some mm. point, uh, I'm not hundred percent. If I got this from somebody else, uh, I'm, I'd be happily corrected. But um, the analogy was that, that getting stronger is like growing a plant or like, uh, like gardening mm -hmm. in that you, you absolutely cannot force it. You can't just 
put a bunch more water on a plant and make it grow. Just like you can't put a whole bunch more training stimulus on somebody and make them stronger. The only thing you can do is try to figure out what the optimal conditions are to allow this to kind of happen right? Because we're not in direct control when we look at how people get stronger and how people react to training. We have a lot of control on the conditions and the environment and all of these sort of external factors, but we can't actively force this thing to happen. And we certainly can't control the rate at which it happens. So the biggest thing I think is to kind of in some way, whether it's just psychologically, just like relinquish a little bit of control and understand that like, the best you can do is facilitate this. You can't yeah. make it happen. You can only facilitate it. And uh, I think for some reason, if people can think about getting stronger in those terms, it takes a lot of stress away. It takes a lot of, uh, you know, like the, the ownership of like, oh, shoot, you know, I, I wasn't able to go up and wait this week. Therefore, I'm a failure. Um, those Those kinds of things that I think plague a lot of newer lifters and i think eventually maybe even deter people from continuing in the sport or with their training so i think if you can if you can try to remove those things and 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 understand that the best you can do is is try to facilitate this and it's worth doing some thinking and and some experimentation to figure out what these optimal conditions are um it just it makes more sense that way to me yeah. so i like that analogy a lot and I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's explained better somewhere else on the internet too. But uh, yeah, but I, 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 I personally think it was a good analogy. I mean, time and time again, I can't help but see it, especially on social media. Like the, um, I, I don't know, I don't know what word the right word to use is, but it's just that need to get somewhere fast, as mm -hmm. opposed to letting it happen organically, almost. Just like how you use that plant analogy. Um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I may be wrong here that it's not, it's not a matter of if, but when sort of yeah. almost, cause you yeah, know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing. But I want to, kind of I want to, I want to go to what you said about the advice about, um, like just find something that, you know, might, might work or, you know, looks like it might work. Has there mm -hmm. ever been a time when, I don't know, like, I know you've worked with a good number of coaches, Mike T being one. Um, has there has there ever been a time when you looked at what was given to you and you're like, what the f what is this? <laughs> um so and yeah, actually, I when I was about to start with Mike, uh, I was on a waiting list with Mike T for I don't know, six months or eight months or something. Waiting like that. list? Hold on, waiting uh, list you said. Yeah. Shit. Yeah, we'll we'll get we'll get to that. But yeah, let's 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 yeah, let's uh yeah. So while I was you know waiting and hoping to get onto his roster of of uh of lifters, um I worked uh with I worked with Brian Carroll for I don't know, two months, three months. Mm -hmm. And I remember getting my programming and I was also this is probably not a fair shake at actually having a coaching relationship with a coach but mm -hmm. you know i signed up with him i think i had four or six weeks headed into a meet so you know who knows um maybe things could have worked out better if we had timed it better but i remember him sending me my program uh and me looking at it and seeing you know like two doubles at 75 percent and like a hundred banded chest flies or something and just being like I don't know. Like, <laughs> and doing it and going through the sessions and just being like, I don't feel like this is doing it for me, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, obviously not having a very good response to it. Um, I think I pulled out of that competition and yeah, it just like, it wasn't a, it wasn't a good match. Wait, was, was this so, with uh, Brian or Mike? Brian. Okay, Brian, cool. Okay, Brian. cool, yeah. cool. And then Mike eventually got back to me and I started with Mike and that was, you know, I want to say 2015, 2014-ish. Mm -hmm. So uh, my my strength, my abilities just exploded uh, once I started working with Mike. That was uh, was absolutely a huge turning point in my in my lifting career. 
Shit. And not once where you, you looked at what he gave you and thought, oh man, not again. No, I definitely, when I got my first program, um, you know, looked it up, used the RPE chart to figure out what percentage I should be using. And, you know, here we go. I'm going in to do my first set of squats and I had to squat five out of eight or whatever. Uh, and looking at the number and being like, what the hell? I'm like, I don't think I can do that, dude. That's insanely heavy. <laughs> what? And, you know, sure as hell, loaded it up, took my ramp up sets. I was like, oh, this, this doesn't feel so bad. And then hit the top set that I was like, I was like, I don't, I don't think this is possible and smoked it. And it was like, oh, okay, I guess we're good. And then nope. basically, you know, that was, uh, you know, that was kind of how things kept going for quite some time. Yeah. So, you know, I'm one, so on that, what you said there, because by the way, um, um, Bryce, I know we started a um, long time ago. Joey's my coach, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of things you're saying there, that's what I go through with him. I look at my program thinking like, no, this man is smoking weed, man. What the hell is he thinking <laughs> I'm going to do? No way. I'm not going to do this. Then I get to my garage. I come out. I'm thinking, oh my God, that was an hour and a half. Damn. That went quick. So I yeah. thought it was going to be like two hours. So yeah, I go yeah. through that. Um, my question on, on that in terms of like patience, sometimes people are not patient, but what would you say the relationship between athletes and coaches, how would that relationship should be? Oh boy, that's a humongous question. Um, I think probably the, the, the biggest thing that's going to be necessary component is just going to be communication. It's just, there just needs to be good communication. It needs to be consistent communication. It needs to be honest communication. Mm. You need to tell your coach when things are going well or poorly, or you tweak your back or you, you know, overshoot something or whatever. Uh, and the coach needs to be honest with the lifter in, you know, potentially, you know, quashing their dreams of hitting, you know, uh, a PR every day, you know yeah. what I mean? Like you kind of yeah, have yeah. to, you know, sometimes bring lifters back down to, uh, back down to earth a little bit, but that can be a tough thing too, because you kind of also at the same time want them to go into their sessions thinking they can run through a wall and do literally anything. Um, so yeah, anyways, that's, that's like a, that, that question is Pandora's box really. Yeah, of, uh, That's literally what my T said in different directions, but I think good yeah. communication is, is definitely the, yeah. the sort of uh base of any any good coach athlete relationship man that pandora's box thing you uh you use was definitely what mike t said also uh I, that's why i can't help but remember it because i remember hearing it from him um now, now that you know mike t's been mentioned and you know what he gave you the rpe scaling mm -hmm. i'm ha I'm, ha I'm so so happy you mentioned it because i didn't want to just like bring it up and just be like yo this could be a very, very vague, like, you know, open-ended question, but I was going to ask, uh, what was your exposure like to RPE scaling prior to, um, Mike T because obviously, like you said, you know, you were like, yo, what the fuck? I don't think I can do this. This is like insane. But what was your exposure like prior to, uh, well, prior, prior to Mike T? Uh, I don't know if I had any prior to Mike. Cool. I, I think, I think Mike was my exposure to that i read his book and started working with him and read all the articles that he put out on everything and that was kind of how i had learned i mean i guess my exposure would have been whatever i had in school like uh learning about the borg scale yeah from whatever what was it like 12 to 24 or whatever how, um, how long so how long did it take for you to sort of like yo i i got this rpe thing on lock like, was it almost immediate? Did it take a bit of time? Was... Oh, I still think I mess it up sometimes. <laughs> Shit. After like, what? You know, a, a seven odd years? In, I think I still make the odd mistake or, you know, you, you take a warm up and it feels good and then you get to a top set and it doesn't feel so good. Uh, or you, I don't know, you're overly hopeful or you're a little bit bullheaded in the, you know, in the hope that like, well, I know last session wasn't good, but this one will be better because sometimes that works, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes that works. And you're like, well, last, last session was just a bad day. I'm just going to keep, keep on, on track and, and like assume progress here. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't work. So 
it's it's not a perfect system i think it, it's it's as much an art as it is a science and you kind of have to have some interpretation you kind of have to have some some faith in some cases yeah um, and in other cases you have to be very very again just like overly honest and kind of just go by the numbers and you know um crush your own your own dreams of hitting prs every day so the, would you say would yeah. you say on that is because again as jerry mentioned there's like seven old years you've been with mike and you've been using the rpe system would mm-hmm. you would you say he's so engraved in you now that you don't see any other thing working rather than that no i definitely wouldn't say that um interestingly enough the last little while i've been going back to utilizing a fair bit more uh percentage-based programming with some of my clients um and not not in the absence of rpe i'll still use rpe but I've been using a bit more of a heavier hand with micromanaging loads, trying to help people, you know, set an appropriate progression throughout their block. I think just using RPEs and the RPE chart in a lot of cases can allow for a fair bit of user error when it comes to, you know, well, that was a seven, we'll just call it a seven. And then next week, the loads are jacked up. Uh, because the percentage isn't adjusting. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I've taken a bit more of a, I don't want to say micromanagement, um, but with some clients like, okay, here's the numbers we're looking to hit less so than here's the RPE. And like, I want you to hit this number and then rate the RPE as objectively as you can. And then we'll go from there and try to use that to inform our next decision and our next decision and our next decision, but kind of laying out a little bit more of a, a bit more of a top-down sort of objective for mm-hmm. the training block, uh, forcing people to undershoot earlier on and giving them a little bit more leeway towards the end of the block kind of thing. What, 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 did, did you sort of uh, cross, not cross over, but did you sort of lean towards a more heavy hand with uh, percentage base? Because I don't know, you had a good portion of your lifters overshooting <laughs> relatively often i wouldn't yeah. say a good portion but i i had a certain number of lifters that uh that tended towards that and i think in a lot of those cases they were lifters who were newer to rpe mm-hmm. um and within the last like year or so i changed um like i stopped using spreadsheets and now we use our app to deliver programming so there are some differences in how i'm communicating the prescription Um, so I think there was a little bit more room for improvement in terms of like the suggested loads that would pop up on people's sheets. So I'm just taking more of a, a long-term look at that. And and in no way am I telling people like, oh, you can't adjust this. You have to hit this number. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's like, okay, I'm going to work with you to come up with a target for today based on what I see in terms of bar speed and technical execution the previous week as opposed to like, okay, well that estimated the max and now RP dictates we're gonna take 83% for this set. So there you go. It's just like automatically done. It's a little bit more of a thoughtful process and, and just trying to be a bit more involved in the selection of like, okay, this is the number we should shoot for this week, taking more context and different sort of you know, context cues from the last little bit of training into account when trying to plan the, yeah. the suggestion for loading just a thought though like what were you like when you first started RP? would you say you were an undershooter overshooter mm-hmm. undershooter for sure oh for real mm-hmm. i don't know because when you mentioned earlier like oh that's that's looking kind of heavy don't know if you can do yeah. that it sounds like you were like oh you might overshoot well that that was my that was my inclination was you know i'd look at something and be like oh i don't know i don't know if i can do that Mm. So my tendency would be to like pull it down a few percent okay, and do something a little lighter. And then I'd be like, oh, that wasn't bad. So the next week I'd be able to go up a little bit and I'd have maybe gotten a little bit stronger. So it allowed me to take a program where everything was programmed at eight and I would hit 7.5, 7.5, 7.5, 7.5, eight, eight, like just in the final weeks of the block, I'd start getting up to the actual RP. So yeah, I think more often than not, than not in the past, uh, I was, I was very much so you just undershot on purpose, basically. 
not so much on purpose. It, oh, it could, oh, it a, could be fear. You were fearful maybe a little that. bit, yeah, yeah, a little bit of like doubt or something like that. But mm-hmm. oh, I, I honestly found that those were often the most productive training blocks. Those okay. were where I gained the most. Those were where I had the most momentum. Those were there where I had the best, uh, like the the best amount of runway, the best response from training was a lot of the times just being a little bit conservative. Mm-hmm. That's actually the word I was going to use, conservative yeah. approach to RPE. One one last bit, because this this is like, I'm wrecking, this, getting my brain juice. I know that's, that's, a coach, that's a coaching mindset right there. So when, when you first like, you know, started doing the RPE scaling, were you mm-hmm. sort of comparing it to the percentages that you may have had, you know, prior to that like okay an eight should be like 85 percent or something like that or so and so or like if this is many reps to try and get a seven would be this percentage is it is it is that the sort of like approach that you took or was it just like i well this feels like so and so so this must be a seven or this must be the eight yeah i would definitely use the rpe chart percentages as they were written um but generally unless it was a single which i found were usually pretty close to the chart i would pull anywhere from like three to four percent off of pretty much everything whoa okay cool and that for me would always give me like at least a good place to start and then from there i wouldn't look so much at the rpe chart i'd look more at okay how was last week's performance was it the right rpe was it not should i go up should i go down and then just kind of use the RPE chart to help me get a starting point for the block. Um, and then kind of go from there based on the previous week's performance. Um, I, w- I would deviate us a bit away from RPEs because I feel like my T should join this conversation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I will probably bring us back a little bit, rewind us back to 2018. This is a little bit controversial, but I want you to clear the air here for me, right? Okay. In 2018, there was a rumor that was going on around between the sponsorship, your sponsorship at that time, right? Mm. I think mm. at that time you were Titans, right? Am I right? Yeah. yeah. So there was a rumor that was going on about, oh, if Bryce doesn't wear an SPD single on the platform, we're not sponsoring the Canadian team. Mm-hmm. Was that true or it was just a rumor? As far as I know, that was part of the contract that was presented to the Canadian team was that all of the members needed to accept the sponsorship and needed to like wear the uh the the sponsored apparel in order for that to be valid shit so if you didn't comply it just basically fucked it up for the entire canadian team that was the wording of the contract uh i think if i had decided that it was that important to me not to wear it it probably like i don't know if they would have like pulled everybody else's stuff, but I also just didn't really want to risk it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, was it not like was it not a, 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 an option where they could say, okay, if if Bryce doesn't want to wear it, then we drop Bryce on the team, and we put someone else in. Uh, you mean like drop me from the world's team or what? Yes, yes. The uh, Canadian, no. fe- I mean the Canadian Federation, thinking, okay. If he, we got two options, so the option A, he's gonna wear it. Option B, if he said he doesn't wear it, and then we're just gonna say, then you can't make the team. We need to find yeah, someone no, else. I don't think that was ever. A, a Hell no! Do you know how big Bryce is, bro? What the? Well, this is the team well, we're talking know. about here. But I also just don't know if they would do that for the sake of the sponsorship. Basically, yeah. what ended up happening was we made a couple of videos about it, um, and I think within a day or two, Ben Banks was on the phone with me like talking about the whole thing and trying to sort it all out and we had a good conversation and and uh you know i expressed my hope that that wasn't how it was worded or you know presented to other teams in the future and it was kind of left at that uh and i i wore the stuff because i didn't want to endanger anybody else's uh ability to get you know potentially because there was money with it as well, right? If you, mm-hmm. if, you if you were on the podium, there was a, a a certain amount of money that was available to you from SBD for that. Yeah. So, 
you know, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I'm just gonna change it to a more a bit more current events here, uh, Bryce, mm -hmm. if that's okay with you. Um, yeah. The Pouting America, they recently posted the Carmine or Carmino uh, sort of totals that's expected to okay. get lifters to qualify for Worlds oh, wow. and, and even, I think even Sheffield. Oh, no, no, Worlds. Then, or they can use the Sheffield total also. Oh, but okay. I don't know if you looked at the numbers, but yo, it was freaking insane. That that's pretty uh, much pretty much numbers that would either come first at Worlds or top two. Yeah, I I saw those posted, and I had heard some rumblings about people thinking that those were, you know, pretty unrealistic. But I hadn't mm -hmm. actually. I mean, I haven't looked into it myself. I haven't talked to anybody uh, who's specifically been affected by that so I'm, I'm not exactly sure what all is uh is going on there i think i think what i spoke to a few americans um people that some of them can hit those numbers or some can't if you look at the numbers they posted the reality is when you look at the american team only the men and the women probably only four three or four people can hit those numbers out of the mm -hmm. entire team because i'm i'm sure pretty sure the 120 plus was something like 1053 something like that wow. and they didn't they a3 they said it was like 825 kilos <laughs> which is wow. mad yeah, that's you know for a qualified world high. that's yeah. mad so yeah. basically the, 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 what people are saying there is it's like like in britain we have an a total and a b total right mm -hmm. that to them is an a total it doesn't necessarily mean you need to hit that number to get to world. But you can win the nationals, but if you close or around that number, you can also be considered in the way of a weight class if people total less. That's, that's the explanation I go from the other Americans. Mm. But mm -hmm. those numbers are insane. So my question leading to that, in Canada, do you guys have some sort of um, like a system like that? Like in Britain here, we have got A total and a B total. Criteria to hit, basically. Yeah, I believe we're implementing more and more of that as time goes on, as we get to the point where we're able to field more and more international level lifters. Um, if I'm not mistaken, still the first criteria is to win nationals. nationals. Like if yeah. you win your category at nationals, you get a ticket, essentially. Um, there's also sort of a minimum where if you win your category, but you know, you're not able to achieve this sort of minimum total then you don't maybe maybe somebody you know maybe they take an alternate before they take you kind of thing um and that's just because there may be people winning categories uh that are just like not filled out or something like that you know mm -hmm. what i mean um so i think there's some systems in place to try and ensure that you know people are winning nationals like against some competition, you know what I mean? So we're sending lifters who are going to be a little bit more competitive or at least so that we can bias our roster towards lifters who are going to be more competitive. Uh, so I think it's, it's not that far from the A total B total thing. Um, but uh, to be honest, I am not exactly sure um, if there's a, a super stringent, um, you know, like number you have to hit. I think I think anything over the minimum, as long as you win your category, is fine. So, in Canada, one thing I've noticed or I've seen, this is just what I've seen, uh, observed. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the juniors, world championship or international, there's a lot of Canadian, and what I mean a lot, there's a lot of Canadian in the team, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty much every single weight class, there's a representative, and these guys are really strong. I.e., you can you we saw. Um, Mandes at the world championship. So do you know why the senior team on the international level, because uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I've, I've never seen a full Canadian team a world. Do you know why is that? Um, I mean, I think we've, we've fielded full teams for sure. Um, but we may have, weight classes where we choose not to send a representative because we can send two who are more competitive in a different weight class. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in, in 2022 this year, um, we sent two 120s on the men's team. So that would have meant 
likely we left another category without any mm -hmm. Canadian men representing in it. So there was no, and that's, there was, there was not any 120 plus, isn't it? We don't have, didn't have any, right. we didn't have any pluses. Yeah. Yeah. So in but, some cases we just don't have people signing up and wanting to go, um, you know, like in the case of the pluses this year, we don't have like a, uh, um, I'm not even sure if I can remember who won nationals in the pluses. It might've been Eric who ended up coming as a 120. Oh, right? wow. So that kind of stuff happens. Uh, it, is that the sort of thing that's under the discretion of the head coach? I don't, I don't know who picks the teams per se, but I'm, I'm guessing it's the Canadian head so coach. I think, again, the way that it goes is that Eric won the 120s, so he got the spot reserved for the 120 men, but then he put in as a – or sorry, he won the 120 pluses, but then he put in as a 120. So after he got accepted to the team, he was able to change his weight class. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh so he was able to change his class. So no, so he came. He, he went in as a 120, but you won the 120, right? Right. So, so if that, there had been, if the second place finisher from the 120s had wanted to go, I think it would have come down to points between Eric and him. Shit, right. that's yo. Isn't that tough though? Because Eric's gonna have to cut. Whereas the dude that came second in the 120s, I I personally don't know what the difference was between you and second place of 120s, but. That's a. I can I can tell you what's big. A, oh, yeah. Okay. Then I think that. it was. I don't know. I totaled probably like eight forty or eight fifty at uh, nationals. And second place and got. Second place would have been I don't know maybe eight ten eight twenty. Also a good a good thirty sure. forty kilos um, difference. Yeah. yeah. Shit. Okay, no, no. So, that, Bryce, Bryce, what what made you go down to the one twenty? Because um, I remember I was watching, I was looking at your um, records. You've done a, a competition at one twenty plus in the quick one, yeah, one of them in one twenty plus. Yeah. And I was I was looking at it. I'm thinking, can I find a video somewhere? Half, how, how I'm not gonna say how fat, but how big Bryce Bryce looks as a one twenty plus. Can. So, yeah, I you know. I think I weighed in at like one twenty point. Oh, four or something uh like i bulked up a little bit to try to just just barely be over for that one competition because i wasn't really competing against anybody it was like mid covid lockdowns we were one mm. of maybe two sporting events that happened in our entire province that summer yeah uh and i had my eyes on a couple of eric's equipped records that i wanted to break in the pluses so I weighed in over 120 so I could compete at plus and take a shot at his records. And I believe I got the national deadlift record in the 120 plus equipped. Yeah. So you just wanted, you basically, you just wanted to wipe Eric off the history books. <laughs> he and I have a long competitive history. We're very good friends and we compete very hard sometimes. I think that's good though. Honestly, yeah. like if some, someone has to push you, but obviously, like obviously now you're back down to 120s in Calgary. You were in one 2018. 105s, yeah. Yeah. Like what was what was like? I don't know. What what were the reasons for the different weight class uh, sort of things you entered? I know you sort of that pretty much went into depth in your YouTube videos, uh, but it's just that you know, just for our viewers and everyone else. Like, mm -hmm. what was the reason? Did you? For the 105 jump to 120, then 120 to 120 plus, and back down to 120, sub 120 again. So 105 to 120 was just, you know, uh, my big thing was a bigger body, bigger total. Mm -hmm. uh, I was specifically looking at the lineup in 2019 at Worlds and thinking, if I go as a 120, I might have a better shot at the podium. And ironically, because of a few choice bombs and a few people not making it, uh, if I had stayed a 105 and even just totaled what I did the year before, I could have actually won. World. <laughs> um, so it worked out very much not in my favor. I was just trying Shit. to get into a more competitive weight class and it, it kind of backfired a little bit. Um, but when I decided to commit to it, it was because I was getting a lot stronger. You know, my best total at 105 is 850. My best total at 120 is 898.5, mm. I think. So you know, that's almost 50 kilos on my total. So Hell yeah. to me, I just, I just wanted to lift more, you know, um, 
after that first competition, I kind of cared a lot less about trying to be in a category where I could place better and more about like, okay, let's just see how far I can push this thing. Let's see what kind of numbers I can hit. You know, let's see how, how strong I can get. So overall, were you happier with the getting bigger and well, going up the weight class? Cause that it I, has, I feel- its, yeah. I mean, it has its, its pros and cons. I definitely, you know, I'm not able to do some of the stuff I used to do. Like I don't go hiking with my wife as much. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I lift more. So <laughs> can, can, I, can, can, can I ask why? Why I don't hike as much? It's too hard. Yeah. <laughs> I, so like, I'm just, it's you, just I'm hauling big. too much weight up the mountain. Uh, my wife got way better at hiking and I gained oh, a bunch no. of weight and got, therefore got way worse at hiking. So now she wants to go out and do these like really, really extreme, like, you know, 300 meters of, or 3000 meters of elevation gain, you know, 5k hike into the trailhead before you start the 11k hike up and down. Uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff she's doing now. And I'm like, I go on hikes when my, uh, when my five and, you know, seven year old niece and nephew can go on them. Those are the hikes that I go on now. <laughs> uh, I was, I was getting pretty good at it when I was like 108, 110 ish. But then as soon as I pushed much beyond that, I just started having a really, really hard time trying to keep up on hikes. So, yeah. Or you, or you can just drive her there and say to her, look, I'm going to wait in the car. So I'll give you three hours for you to come down in the car for nine hours. <laughs> Nine hours. hours. Nine hours. Three hours. I can go on those ones. Yeah, it's, the, it's it's the nine hour ones that she goes on that I that I don't partake in. Would you say that's so, the that's like the main form of cardio you do? Yeah, usually just walking my dog, going for hikes, mm. that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. I mean, talking about um, deadlifts, you spoke you spoke about the deadlift there by the numbers mm-hmm. in terms of like you go big because you wanted a bigger total mm-hmm. and bigger numbers, right? So going forward, right? Where do you think you can push your pull at? Um, it's hard to say. Um, I think my goal right now, if I can get healthy again, would be to try to pull 400 raw. Um, and then, I don't know, anything beyond that's cherry on top. But that's another, you know, one of those things in the back of my head that's rolling around that I'm hoping to, to be able to make real one day. Have you loaded 400 in the gym? Mm, I've done 400 from blocks. Um, I think I did 410 from blocks once. Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't loaded 400 raw though. No, I think the most I loaded was like, Hmm. Raw. The most I've loaded was probably around 389, 390, somewhere in there. Shit. That's still relatively close, bro. Yeah. Yeah. That's not far. Yeah. I don't think I got those. You know, like I'm the gonna... heaviest deadlift I got was I've gotten successfully was at 385.5 in Sweden. Mm. But uh, yeah, when you're getting to that point, you know, two kilos is a fucking lot. Hell so, yeah! What the yeah. fuck? And it takes a long time. It takes a long time to put those two kilos on. So I don't. But know. people, tell me, you know, this is why I, I I was even telling Joey the other day. People sometimes forget like, oh yeah, Bryce has pulled like 385.5, so that means 390 should be easy. People forget, you know, no, he's not adding 4.5 kilo on that. You guys are forgetting there's another 385 kilo on that bar, mm. right? It's not because sometimes when you put that two kilos, people think, oh, yeah, just two kilos. Next comp, you get it. Yeah, but are you forgetting yeah. the other 380 kilos on the yeah. bar? So people And do I think one of the other things sometimes. is how how difficult it is to to train with those weights that are necessary and with the intensity and and whatever else that's necessary to drive that performance from you know 385 to 390 that's a that's a lot of work that's a lot of reps with like 330 340 310 three whatever the accumulation is is gonna be uh, nuts it's tough and it's tough to like keep your body together to do Mm -hmm. all that work at that load at that intensity for that long so uh-huh. yeah, I don't know. It's a balance. So I got I got I got a question on that um big deadlift you we we're talking here. Would you say it was there in South Africa when Anna tried the 385? I think I'm the one that turned around and told you, Bryce, have you seen what Anna's done? It was like, yeah, mate, that's that's <laughs> nuts. <laughs> so would you say if Anna load 
399 kilo at the euros in december because that's what he's planning to do okay. if this kid pull that 399 you big pullers around the world if you look at him doing that would you say that would be something that will inspire you guys to even push further because you'll be like hang on the kid is like well half my size is pulling that mm-hmm. i should push and pull more i mean i'm never not going to push for more I don't know if his like performance necessarily uh, feels like any kind of specific driver or motivator or anything like that. Um, I, you know, I think that's incredible and I shake his hand and tell him good fucking job. Don't ever stop deadlifting. (laughs) But I don't know if like internally, if that kind of thing, like somebody else's performance really drives me, whether it's good or bad or big or small or whatever, you know, uh, I, I have my own reasons for wanting to, wanting to do things and wanting to do more and wanting to, you know, achieve a certain level of things. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I see too much like motivation from that, uh, as much as I would just, yeah, want to give him a pat on the back that, and tell him that, that brings, that's incredible. That brings me to say, to ask you, when you start powerlifting, you start doing the sport, you start enjoying it, as you mentioned in the beginning, we all mm-hmm. had someone we look up to, right? We feel, we feel oh, that guy's an incredible. You know, if mm-hmm. I can do half of what he's doing, I'm happy. Did yeah. you have someone like that into your circle or just you watching around the world thinking that's a role model right there? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, when I first got into lifting, um, you know, I watched all the old, I don't even know if you guys know, like the Power Unlimited. You ever seen that? old documentary from like the 90s i'm gonna be honest and say no maybe was... one of the first powerlifting documentaries that uh that kind of existed as far as i know um but yeah in that was like ed Cohn and kirk karwaski um and uh medote and i don't know a bunch of other lifters and at the time you know watching them lift was awesome and inspiring and super cool for me to see um, I think I was, once I started to realize and understand that there's a big difference between tested and untested powerlifting, although those guys were in the IPF before the weight classes changed, which I think was a, a, an excuse to wipe the, the record book clean. But yeah. Um, yeah, when I, when I, you know, started getting more into like, okay, well, let's look at these like IPF lifters. So that's way more where I'm at. You know, I'm, I'm never going to look like Kirk Karwaski and I'm probably never going to lift like him. So let's just uh let's rein it in a little bit um it was mike like mike t i don't know i I remember looking at mike's training and watching him lift and seeing the stuff he was doing raw and equipped and uh that was yeah that was it to me i was like that's that's the best this is the best those like everything he lifted was huge and it was just so so sick and then when i got into equipped lifting it was pretty much the whole ukrainian men's team Mm. It was, it was, you know, Billy and Rubitz and Semenyanko and, um, Anatoly, Anatoly has done equipped as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anatoly was, I think that was a little bit after I was like really getting into equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe not, but he's 93, right? Yeah, yeah, he was a 93, but now he's a 105. When he did, he did equip, now, okay. he was a 93. Yeah, but yeah. to be fair, Anatoly, when you think, if you said you've been in the sport for a decade or so, he's young. Mm-hmm. He's still mm-hmm. like, I think he's still at like 20. He's probably 25, still been lifting for the 26. same amount of time I have, but. <laughs> <laughs> just, we just didn't know. The Ukrainians are built different, man. Okay. I but, mean, you see them at world, their profile, you see like a 23-year-old, they will be saying, oh, they've been lifting for like eight years. He's just thinking like, yeah. what? When did you start lifting, yeah. mate? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Bryce, um, if it's right with you, um, I'm, I'm going to try and see if this is in your, uh, in the back of your head as well. But like Sheffield, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, the list I don't think has been uh, shared yet, like with the wild cards and everything else. Mm-hmm. Have you given it much thought about like who you would want there? Like to oh, go? Um no no pressure of course it's just you know it's... i think the the one guy that stands out and like i don't know correct me if he has been invited but i think i think jesus missed his total to get his invite 
And I think that's probably one of the guys that I would think, in my opinion, deserves to be there, mm-hmm. um, despite not having a you know fantastic day at his yeah. latest international. Um, this this three I, yeah, I haven't even seen. So chances going right. Yeah, yeah. There is, a, I think, there is four um, wild card for the men left, and four mm-hmm. for the women, if I'm right. Because um, there's a few people around across the region that have got the other one. So mm-hmm. you, you said he's just there for the man. So there's three left. Chances every world champion in South Africa yeah. is going to Sheffield. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe John Keiko. Keiko. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd love to see him and Chance square off again. That was some incredible lifting. Hell yeah. What about Emil um, though? Not 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 putting him okay. in the mix. Emil Krostev? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Emil would be great, too. I don't know. Throw them all in there. Shit. But if you had Why to not? pick one or the other? Between, uh, I'd have to, I'd have to, like, look at their, their numbers specifically and see what I thought about that. Because I think that's what it would come down to for me. Okay. Like, I'll, okay. Who's, I, 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 who's I'll put give up you, the numbers? I'll give you the numbers. Emil, um, 877.5, mm-hmm. right? And so Emil, I think Chance beat Emil by five kilos. And Emil's last attempt at World, they were all like, if I, I put in RPE, some of them were eight, and some of them were nine. And even we had him on the platform on the podcast here. He said he wanted to be conservative because he wanted a nine nine nine. Mm-hmm. Right. So with Kaiko, we saw what happened. I think Kaiko told us eight um seven, eight, seven, two, something like that. Eight, seven, mm-hmm. two and a half or seven, five. So these are the numbers. Okay. So they literally, they were not far off chance and Kaiko was not far off Emil. Only yeah. one deadlift could have won the world or one deadlift could have been second. So these yeah. are the numbers. So you still go for Kaiko or Emil? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. All right. Okay, let's keep let's, Kaiko let's, let's keep let's Kaiko. On. Let's keep Based Kaiko on the in. numbers, it probably say Emil. Oh, shit. Okay. Oh, wow. That would be a battle. That was quick, boy. She changed your mind <laughs> real quick. Um, well, I still so, have to look at the numbers, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that, I think, would be what would sway my vote as to who gets to go. But I also don't decide any of this. So, yeah, no, it's, 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 my just, opinion it's just a little really It just happened. <laughs> two more, two more, Bryce. That's two, two more, two more. Oh, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. So you re- I, I think this just shows that like, he really doesn't like really watch. Um, the lifting uh, stuff much considering like yeah. everyone... no he was he was in south africa he watched the battle he was just he what you trying to say here let me paraphrase he was not just too excited about some battles that's why he's not choosing anyone in those battles am i wrong mm, i don't even know if it's that i just think like i don't know i'll be i'll be interested and excited by probably whoever goes i think it's going to be like one of the coolest things that powerlifting has when it happens and i don't know if i have any like horse in the race as to who i think should go you know i know um some of the people at sbd really really well uh at this point and i bet that they are putting a lot a lot a lot of time and thought and number crunching and all that kind of stuff into their selection Mm -hmm. and uh i think it's going to be I think it's going to be a pretty insane and pretty awesome showcase. Oh, would yeah. you come? Uplifting. Would you come to watch it? Would you be there yourself? Uh, if I could, if I, if I could swing it like financially and time wise and make everything line up, absolutely. Yeah. Do you have any picks? Because uh, obviously there's like there's a confirmed list of who won the world champs uh, mm-hmm. on both sides. But do you have any picks like top three? Uh, on men's and women's oh, at all. You guys are really grilling me here. Um, <laughs> I, I don't. I don't have it. I haven't put a lot of thought into it. I haven't uh, internalized or memorized even the list of lifters who are going. I've just been selfishly focusing on my own. My hey, own stuff. I, 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 by, I, by the way, let me let me just give you one day. Jessica is going. By the way, if you're not interested in knowing, but Jessica is yeah, going. I know she's going. Okay, because yeah. you said you're not interested in the lifters that are not going. So I'm just saying that Jessica is going. I never said I wasn't interested. Okay, okay. you don't watch. I so, uh, basically, on, when Joey asked the men or the women top three, you don't know. Yeah. Even Jessica, you don't know where Jessica Jessica will place. 
I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure she'll do super well, but I don't know like what other lifters might be smaller and where the formula favors people. And like, I don't know, there's going to be a lot of different metrics of success when we're talking about like breaking records is going to like net you a certain amount of money. And if not points, I don't know if they're going to use the standard formula. Like there's a whole bunch of other stuff in behind it all that I just like, I don't know if I knew exactly how every single thing was going to be scored and had all of the uh, coefficients and numbers and everything like that in front of me, maybe I could uh, come up with some predictions, but yeah. I'm just looking forward to watching. Yeah, I just, I just want to, I just want to watch people lift weights. Yo, if they, if they, if, you know, if SBD ever do um, an equipped uh, version of Sheffield, Mm. would you be up for that? Would you be like, all right, cool. Let's go. It's my time. Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, I don't think that'll ever happen. I, I, I but, mean, we're just, we're just, we're just I mean, the world games are, are already yeah. there, right? Yeah, but is is there um money prizes for world games? I'm not entirely sure. No, I don't think so. But there yes, would be f- just fame and glory, right? Exactly, fame and glory. It is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but the, I'm just saying, it would be nice to have it too. Of uh, it would be, but I think set. SBD has a lot more vested interest in mm, classic a yeah. raw competition because yeah, yeah, they don't yeah. make any mm. equipped lifting and, equipment. Um, I don't think Bryce, they I, I know we uh, we probably taken a few, um, um, some time now. I mean, I know you pulled out of the Commonwealth and you said mm-hmm. that you are nursing a few injuries. Uh, would you mind telling us um, what 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 are the injuries? Because a lot of people were looking forward to seeing you to lift at the Commonwealth because they were thinking, you to. know what, this is going to be good, a good one. So what yeah. was the injury? Uh, so I've been dealing with some hip stuff since 2015 or so. Uh, and that's been on and off and has really, I feel like, slowed the progress of my squat over the years specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, and lately has started to impact my deadlift more and more. Uh, but the big one that, that has basically stopped me dead in my tracks from being able to train was my knee. Um, I've regressed to the point where like, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, body weight squats were pretty tough. Um, Damn. going up and down stairs was, was rough. Uh, my knee prior to worlds was really swollen. So clearly there was something wrong with it, but it wasn't painful and it didn't really stop me from lifting. So I was like, well, what? I'm, I'm not going to stop training. Like I'm two weeks out from worlds. We're just going to do this and deal with it afterwards. Um, so, you know, kept pushing, pushed on through, I came back to training and it was kind of so, so I thought maybe it was a bit on the mend. Um, and then it just got worse and worse, you know, despite me trying to play it conservative and play it safe and pull back on stuff. It just kind of got worse and worse and worse and went from being swollen to being very painful, pretty much no matter what I was doing with it. Uh, and then my other knee started acting up because I was clearly favoring my other side yeah, to try to take yeah. some, uh, yeah, to compensate. So, uh, yeah, yeah. At that point I was like, okay, well, you know, I, I think it was maybe nine weeks or 10 weeks out and the deadline for changing the nominations was coming up and I still hadn't been able to squat or deadlift really much at all. And I, I couldn't justify like, taking the spot i couldn't justify going and putting in a token performance or pushing and forcing a meet through and having another performance like i did in south africa because i don't i'm not super happy with with that or or how it went or how i performed um you know so i didn't and also i think i would have you know if i if i would have done that i would force it through i would have had a bad meet and then i would have been banged up for longer you know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. Which, it's very much like picking your battles almost, especially like with the situation yeah. that you're in. Yeah. Um, actually, Bryce, I, you know, because, you know, I, like Jordan said, we've taken up quite a bit of your time and I, I want to ask just two last questions. Okay. Um, th- this one, because I know you, you're not re- pretty much uh, versed as of late with the numbers around for lifters, but how are you with the, um, the different coaching teams um, around the world, like have you sort of pretty much, you know, looked into the works that they're doing and everything else much? Again, probably not as much. <laughs> oh, like man. What, do you have 
questions specifically about a, a group like the, uh, the French no, lifters or what what are you getting at here no, no nothing specific it's because uh because you know, when we had Mike T on I asked him who he thought was like top three in his head like that's like doing a good you know in his opinion a good amount of work when mm -hmm. it comes to you know having lifters and what they do with them and I, I can't remember from, from the top of my head who or which teams but I was wondering if you had some in mind yeah i mean the french lifters come to mind i've definitely seen a real explosion of of the french lifters coming out and you know putting up huge performances and putting up a lot of lifters in a number of different categories mm -hmm. um you know it looks like a lot of their lifters have some pretty unique technical aspects they're lifting like the super super low bar squats um <laughs> you know, is one thing that, that I think a lot of people pick up or, or, you know, associate with their, their lifting. Um, yeah, that's probably, I don't know, one that comes to mind. Damn. And it's so super, they have that super low bar squat and a super, super narrow squat as well. Yeah. If you look at the yeah, how the narrow the squat yeah. is, sometimes like I look at some of the ladies, I'm thinking, how you be, how are you even doing a volume on that? How? Yeah, you, your, your knees, <laughs> you know. So and again, as you mentioned, not many people have probably um, seen that. Yeah, go on, Jerry. Uh, and uh, for my last question, what's what's next? Like, what's next for you? Like, uh, is it C, is it CPU Nats? Is it CPU? I think it's CPU. CPU. Yeah. Yeah. yeah CPU Nats. Uh, yeah. yeah. In terms of competitions, that'll be the that'll be the next one. Hopefully, uh, yeah. at this point, I've pretty much. I've, I've told myself that I'm going to take as long as it takes to get healthy. So I'm hoping that uh, I can make the Nats and Worlds run happen and be healthy by that point. But uh, I'm not going to handcuff myself to that too. Yeah. Because I'm, you know, I'm pretty, I'm committed to getting to a place where I can train and not be in pain all the time. And maybe that's why I'm not like following a lot of lifting super closely right now because I, I don't feel super connected to like the competitive aspect of it because i'm trying to you know mentally and physically take a bit of a step back from that so i mean know, I, yeah I that plays into things that well yeah definitely i think it's uh, an approach you're taking to well just overall betterment of yourself as an individual as opposed to external factors you're looking at more like the internal stuff to pretty much keep you going along like in terms of longevity uh, mm -hmm. correct me if i'm wrong um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the whole point is to try to get back to a point where I can, where I can train and, and push hard. And, you know, I have been kind of saving my, my mental energy and attention for the lifters that I coach and the lifters that they're competing against in whatever competitions they're doing. So, you know, I'll be, I'll be looking at, uh, the 93s at open worlds. I'll be looking at the 120 plus is raw and equipped, uh, masters worlds coming up. And, you know, it's, it's kind of more context specific. I don't necessarily have the bandwidth to, to like, think about the whole of powerlifting. Cause there's also just so much going on, man. Like there's oh, yeah. so many good lifters breaking so many records yeah, and there's man. so many big meets now. And, you know, um, like junior worlds is becoming more and more of a big spectacle in its own right. And, you know, showcasing a lot of insane talent and, uh, it's just, yeah, it's a lot to a lot to try to keep tabs on and and yeah i've been just like i said saving my focus for for my lifters and my people you know oh my god i no sorry i just thought of a question real quick do you mm -hmm. have a preference um as to the what kind of coach you prefer doing uh would you say you're you you enjoy the sort of the programming and like sort of building the lifter up to the competition or do you enjoy like actually being there on, I don't know what you might call it, like game, game day, coaching. day coaching. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're, they're both like the best really. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I would, I would never ever want to do, I don't think anything else for a living. Um, and getting back to more game day coaching. Like I think Westerns was the first meet I've done game day coaching at in a while Yeah, because yeah. you know, COVID and lockdowns and a lot of my clientele are international. So the game day coaching that I'm doing is, you know, watching the stream. If it's not at 2 AM mm -hmm. my time, 
um, and, you know, going through looking at some of their competition in some cases, trying to plan their attempt selection, having meetings with them, going over previous footage and seeing what might be there for the day. Um, but I was able to game day coach a number of lifters at Westerns recently. And that was, that was a lot of fun. I really love game day coaching and missed it a lot. Um, but yeah, the, the like weekly session of programming and creative problem solving is just always so good for my brain. And I enjoy, like I said, I'm starting to like almost micromanage people more, uh, and try to get like more involved with the numbers they're taking in training and the decisions they're making and try to like really guide their hand with a lot of the training decisions, because I've seen enough trends in the lifters of mine that do well and the things that they're doing that I'm trying to like get more lifters to think like that and make more decisions like that. So, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I have a preference. I think they're both absolutely integral to coaching powerlifting. Of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Me, me, I only have one question Bryce for you yeah it's when is Bryce will, will stop lifting not coaching lifting when when is that time when when do you think when mm-hmm. you sit down with your missus thinking do you know what after what happened today or after what happened this year or I was after what's going on I think mm-hmm. it's, it's about time um I don't think I'll ever not lift yeah, yeah. I can the wheels I, fall off. Until I can't. You know what I mean? Yeah. There yeah. might be a time and that might be sooner rather than later. I don't know. There might be a time when I decide that I don't want to, you know, try to push to be at IPF Worlds. Um, or like, you know, try to break my previous best deadlift record, uh, or whatever. But I don't think I'll ever not lift. And I, like I think that. even even when I do decide that okay, maybe there's not, you know, uh, an all-time PR ahead of me. It's Mm -hmm. like, okay, well, you know, um, well, now I compete in masters or whatever. You know what I mean? Like I'm I'm never going to stop lifting and I don't think I'm ever going to stop competing. It's just at what level of competition can I keep up? And that's going to be determined by, I don't know, how well my body comes back from this and how well it holds together from there on. Yeah. Damn. Honestly, that's so inspiring to hear. That's uh, it. That's, you know, I mean, we gotta have to have uh, Bryce back on the pod, Joey. Maybe next year, sometime when he's healthy. Because yeah. if he said that you're gonna stop next year, or maybe when you are 36, and then I would say, okay, thanks, mate. I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, de- I'm definitely, not going anywhere. Definitely looking forward to. Uh, I mean, like Jurance J- J- plans to go to Malta. I'll be there whether. No, I have to oh, win the bridge first, mate. Come on, yeah, I have to I, win the bridge first. So it's not just me getting on the plane, bro. I'll be there. I'll be there for fun. I don't care. Like I have, to, I have to see like you know Bryce, everyone, like, just everyone, just because uh, yeah. I know it's gonna be fucking amazing, man. It's I feel as though it's gonna be like bigger than last year, bigger I think than this it'll year. Be a big one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do. So, yeah. I I think just last um last comment for me, Bryce, is people like yourself. And Mike T and the rest, sometimes you don't realize how much you've inspired and influence around the world and influence people mm-hmm. around the world. I mean, we started the conversation where we were talking about just hook grip. I was never hook gripping before. So it was, so it was Joey. Joey said to me, look, if Bryce can do it, we can do it too. All right? Let's get into it. And mm-hmm. literally like my deadlift went from a particular, yeah, of course, I'm not lifting like some of the AE three now pulling 350 or whatever, but I know I will get there one day. But still, the deadlift has blown in terms of where it was when I started uh, the hook grip. So yeah. just to say, like, whatever you're doing, keep on doing it. And however you're doing it, don't change it because these people out there are watching. You're not realizing that people are watching. Funny enough, is I was watching your deadlift the other day when you mentioned about rehab pool. Mm-hmm. I was looking at it, but although I know you're in pain, you're lifting it, but I still was looking at the technique, the way you were lifting it. I'm thinking, like, okay, he's injured. He's still pulling. So what would I do when I get injured? This is the technique I should adopt when I get injured. So he's not breaking no technique here. His technique is spot on, even though he's injured. So basically, just to say, 
people are still watching, even though yourself, you're, you're not watching other people, but people like us are still watching you. So don't stop doing it. Well, thank you for saying so. No, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll keep posting Honestly. my rehab deadlifts for you. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 honestly, Bryce, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I hope Absolutely. you know th th this chat has been fun, at least, and uh, insightful. Well, it was, it was for me anyway, and I hope for Durance also. But yeah, Absolutely. thank you, and I hope you know we get to see you next year in Malta. Me too. Um, and man, you never know. Maybe at the next Commonwealth, wherever it is. Hopefully, you get yeah. to do that one. Maybe yeah, Sheffield, cool. Birmingham, in Sheffield. He just Maybe. said he might be there. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I won't. I definitely won't be competing, but uh, maybe, maybe I'll be in the audience. Yeah. Uh, that would be good because if you're in the audience, that means the drinks will be on us, so we that can get you drunk in Britain. Hell yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Awesome. Yeah. Cheers, Thank mate. you so much, man. I hope you enjoyed okay. the rest yeah, of the day, bro. Cheers, Thank guys. you. Bye. Thank bye, you. Bye. Have a nice day. You too.